On a brand new Josh Nason's Punch Out, we welcome back author Guy Evans, who talks about his book, Sitting Ringside, Volume 1, the biography of David Penzer, former WCW ring announcer, TNA ring announcer, and so on and so forth. We talk about that. We talk about uh, Guy's appearance and contributions to the Who Killed WCW series that's currently airing on Vice TV. We also talk about WCW in general, Nitro, uh, his previous book, and all kinds of other stuff as well. Great conversation as always with Guy Evans coming up now on Josh Nason's Punch Out. So for the first time in a long time, I am joined by a, uh, a past guest, of course, wrote the book Nitro, uh, the incredible, if I get the full title here, guy, the incredible rise and inevitable <laughs> collapse of Ted Turner's WCW, a uh, book I quite enjoyed, and that came out uh, several years ago, and uh, guy, guy Evans, our guest this week, was on that show, and of course, he is the co-author of a brand new book, Sitting Ringside, Volume 1. This is co-written with, of course, David Penzer, the longtime uh, ring announcer for WCW, and also did some work with uh, TNA and uh, XWF and, and other organizations, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those experiences and how he's going to be talking more about those uh, uh, later in uh, the year, perhaps. And uh, yeah, we'll welcome uh, Guy Evans to the show. Guy, again, we were talking before, but I, for the sake of the audience, I welcome you once again and say, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Josh. It's great to connect with you again. Can't believe it's been almost six years, I guess. But uh, has it been really that long? Yeah, it, it has. And you know, I, I so appreciated you shining a light on the Nitro book back then, and uh, glad that, from what I understand, uh, from what you've read of Sitting Ringside, you're enjoying it as well. So uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you about that today. Thank uh, you. I, yeah, I am. Yeah, and I, I will tell you, guy. Um, you know, as, as people get older, what the doctors tell us is you're supposed to you know lose weight and get lighter and all this stuff. Your sitting ringside is slightly lighter than nitro. I actually weighed the book. I actually weighed the books this morning and nitro yeah, weighs not much difference. Yeah, nitro is 1.15 pounds and uh, sitting mm. ringside. I have it on my scales 1.08. So slightly less, <laughs> but uh, still uh, quite dense and uh, in a different way. And we'll get into that. But yeah, I, we were talking beforehand, uh, recording this on Wednesday morning, uh, June 5th. So I believe that June's already here. But mm -hmm. uh, I was watching, uh, I'm almost all the way through the first episode of uh, Who Killed WCW, the uh, brand new mm -hmm. four-part docu-series that is airing on Vice TV. And you can, uh, for those people who don't have Vice like myself, you can actually buy the documentary, uh, buy the whole series on YouTube, bought it for like seven bucks uh, today. So mm -hmm. you can, uh, seven, I didn't even think of seven bucks, seven bucks entertainment. How about that? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I was watching the, uh, the first episode on YouTube today and I'm watching it and Lo and behold, wow, this very handsome chap's on there. Oh, it's Guy. Guy was on the show. So tell us about the, that experience and, and how you get asked to be on it. And and uh, do you have any involvement with the show or anything or, or simply as a uh, as a talking head, so to speak? Yeah, no, it's it's quite interesting. So um, I think last October, um, the, the Vice people reached out to me first to inquire if I would be interested in being an interviewee and they sort of made it clear and I think you know Evan Husney kindly has mentioned this in a few interviews that they were quite you know inspired by the Nitro book and they were really looking at this quite closely in terms of developing what their story would be and so we had that initial conversation and that that kind of led to us saying you know, maybe we should explore kind of a deeper, you know, working relationship here. And that led to them um, bringing me on as a production consultant. So um, I've actually been, you know, quite involved with the show ever since that point. And they were really, um, uh, you know, able to to connect me with, again, Evan and Paul Taylor, the, the showrunner, um, Tara Hughes and Dave Hodgson, some really talented producers at Vice. So I really got a, a good appreciation of you know, kind of what goes into something like this and uh, was very happy with what I was able to contribute. So um, I've been sort of seeing cuts of these episodes for a few months now, but, uh, you know, nothing beats actually tuning in and knowing that you're watching this at the same time as everyone else. And um, as I've said in a couple of other places and on social media, um, I just think they did a, a tremendous job with telling the story in a way that, um, 
you know, made it fresh, I think, for people who lived through it, but also was intriguing for those who perhaps, you know, are too young to have an awareness of the WCW story. Um, and the fact that you have all of these voices um, included gives you, I think, much more of a holistic, sort of well-rounded uh, understanding of what happened versus perhaps some of the other documentaries that WWE and so forth have done in the past. So I can tell people if you enjoyed that, that first episode, uh, it only gets better as time gets goes on. And um, in particular, that final episode I thought was just masterfully done. And that's that's something w which will uh, get a lot of people talking, I'm sure. Yeah. So I, what that was one of the things I wanted to bring up is it, it was watching it today and kind of thinking about this in general. I think when it first came out, you know, people are saying we're we're still you know we're still talking about WCW, and <laughs> obviously you know your book came out several years ago. Brian Alvarez's book came out quite a bit ago. We had the WWE documentaries, which I think you know going into it not exactly the most impartial, <laughs> you know, telling of, of things when it comes to that. That's and, being kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we think we understand that. But there's a, you know, there's dozens of uh, of uh, retro podcasts, so to speak, that cover mm. all this stuff and going through Thunder and and uh, and Nitro and and so many things. Uh, there's something about it. And it's very similar to ECW in in people like for for my age. I'm I'm 46, and that lived through that era. Uh, lived through having to had difficulty trying to find wrestling on TV, and thanks to a C-band satellite dish that my dad installed, because um, we lived out in the middle of nowhere, I was able to find ECW, and, and my world kind of expanded out from you know what was provided to me. And there's just this, you know, this nostalgia feel with WCW and very similar to ECW that people just, they can't seem to let, let it go. They, they, in, in a way of that, they, they really want to talk about it still, you know, it's almost like mm -hmm. a therapeutic uh, exercise in, in so many ways that, that they want to understand, they want to be able to cope and understand why this thing that meant so many, that meant so, so much to so many different uh, generations is, uh, it's gone and and they want to remember the good times and understand the bad times and and uh kind of get get some i i don't know if it, i i think like i guess i'm trying to say is there's no such thing as closure when it comes to <laughs> wcw and ecw i don't know if you feel the same way there's just people just seem to they want to talk about it and i, and I think that's uh that can be a good thing yeah i think you could take one viewpoint that says well this is just nothing but simple nostalgia you know and anything that was popular in the past is destined to be revisited in the future and i think to some extent that's true of course logically you would anticipate that over time that that would diminish somewhat but i actually think and this is just my personal opinion i actually think that there's something a little bit deeper at play which is you know, when you think about the story of WCW or ECW, as you mentioned there, the Monday Night Wars era, the mid to late 90s, early 2000s uh, time period in wrestling, I think those uh, time periods or those uh, discussions about those times are as much about the time itself as they are the actual wrestling companies and the content of the shows at times. Um, you know, I think for, for those people who are sort of coming of age in the 90s, for example, who are older now and have the ability to look back and perhaps think about the ways in which, you know, the world has changed for better in some cases and, and possibly for worse in other cases. Um, I think that's what they sort of associate with a lot of the the programming that people still love to go back and, and, and dissect. And then, of course, in the case of WCW, it's just a, even still today, just an unbelievable story when you consider how quickly everything fell apart and how, you know, they went from you know being in the in in a, in a position where I think it's safe to say prior to Nitro, no one could have reasonably predicted that two or three years from now they're going to going to be a legitimate part of pop culture, mm -hmm. and they were able to achieve that only for you know just a complete deterioration of their paying audience and um, a complete collapse of of their business in, sh in such a short period of time. And so I think people are just fascinated by that dynamic. Uh, of course, there have been other wrestling companies that have come along since, but they haven't had those meteoric highs and uh, and just insane lows, which we saw, especially in the last 18 months of, of WCW. So I think what you're touching on there is a, is a topic that um, personally I've, I've discussed with a number of people, and I think it, it, it often comes up um, in terms of people trying to figure out why is there just such a persistent interest in this and and i i can think about conversations i've had with neil pruitt for example who was in the show last night mm -hmm. uh he was the feature producer with wcw famously the the voice of the nwo and he and i've had many conversations to this end where he said you know man it's been we're talking nearly 30 years now since a lot of this nwo stuff was happening and you would almost believe that it happened yesterday mm -hmm. and so 
I don't know if it's as simple as, yeah, anything that was popular in the past is destined to be revisited again. I do think there's some added dynamics because of uh, how much the world has changed, you know, from a technological standpoint, how much our culture has changed, how much society has changed. And so people, when they go back and look at these shows, I think they associate those shows with some other um, some other sort of aspects in their mind. In, and that's that's my personal opinion. But it is it is fascinating to be sure that here we are in 2024 and we have a, a new four-part series, which I think has been done very, very well. Yeah, and one of the things that I liked about the first episode and one of the things that I, I mentioned, uh, we did our uh, podcast years ago talking about the Nitro book, and I've told you is mm-hmm. that I, I like hearing from the people that are behind the scenes and mm-hmm. I mean, really behind the scenes, like, you know, the, uh, you know, production assistants and, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, um, uh, Neil Pruitt and guy mm-hmm. and Brad Siegel and, and some of these people that they were decision makers, but they're not like, they're not promoting podcasts, put it that way. And, right. you know, they, they're, they're just telling a story. And I was, um, uh, I, I used to work in pro sports. I worked pro sports for what, six or seven years. Mm-hmm. And if they did a, you know, if they did a documentary on uh, my time or the the era of the Manchester Monarchs, a a a, a HL team that had a huge rise, and then uh, about twenty years later was no longer in existence, uh, the players mm-hmm. wouldn't be the most interesting people to talk to. I mean, a couple would right. be. It'd be right. the people that lived the day in and day out. The people that have the documentation, like in like in sitting Correct. ringside, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the people that were in those meetings and not key decision makers, but they had their ears open. They were responsible for X, Y, and Z to make the machine run. And yes. those are the people that they, they're really going to give you the story because they'd have no ulterior motive not to. This was the experience in their life. And if they're telling it straight, it's not like, you know, they're going to besmirch their reputation or anything. They're, they're to say, this is what happened. And I, that's what I, I enjoy hearing about the people that are not the the frontliners, so to speak, the the celebrities. I like hearing from the the other people. That's one something I noted on the doc last night again. Your book, and even someone like David Penzer, even though he was uh, you know visible, he's not you know he's not the uh, people aren't buying pay per views to see David Penzer. They're buying pay per views to see the people he's announcing. But he sees and hears and you know all these things. That's the to me, those are the most fascinating people to hear from because they want to tell the story. You're absolutely right. You hit on a number of important points there. I think a lot of times you can be too close to something, first of all, um, and that's especially true if you are a participant. You 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 gave the example of professional sports. Um, also have a bit of a background in that area as well. If I was to write a book about a basketball team, I would want to talk to the players on the team for sure. But if we were going to go into the inner workings of how the organization ran, you know, many of them by choice actually don't want to know about that kind of stuff. You know, they're in their own bubble. They're in a, a, a they have tunnel vision where they're focusing on the games coming up and they couldn't even tell you about some of the discussions that's going on at a higher level. And I think a lot of times you see that being the case in wrestling as well. Um, again, that's not to say that their voices shouldn't be front and center because they are the most important people as the people on the screen, but there's obviously a, a much bigger story to tell there. And uh, you, you mentioned David Penzer, and again, I can't recommend uh, the, the book enough, Sitting Ringside. Um, there's so many stories in the book where he talks about you know being in the uh, announcer's trailer at WCW. So prior to an episode of Nitro or Thunder, they would have two or three hours where the Bobby the Brain Heenans of the world and Gene Okerlunds and Tony Schiavone's Mike Tenay's and so forth would be sitting around telling stories. Yeah, and as David yeah. and as and as David tells it, he was a fly on the wall essentially. He was there listening to all of this and didn't you know necessarily contribute sometimes as much as um, the other people, but sat back and listened and laughed and and joined in you know uh, when appropriate. And he remembers all of that stuff in a tremendous amount of detail. And why why wouldn't you right if you were in that position? So um, you just think about in any particular wrestling organization or in any organization period, there's all of those kind of people scattered around that remember intricate details and moments that can really add to people's understanding of a time period. And I think that's what people will take away from this book is it's not necessarily, or it's not at all actually a rehashing of things that you've heard 500 times before. It's a very interesting, I would say, fly on the wall perspective from someone who grew up admittedly as a super wrestling fan and and didn't really want to do anything else with his life other than work in wrestling. And, he, and then all of a sudden finds himself in a position where he's in the middle of the, the wrestling boom. So it's, it's very interesting. 
Yeah, and we'll uh, get that book in just a second. I do want to ask a question because since the last time we spoke, uh, mm -hmm. you also uh, co-authored another book uh, with a the guy. Not, I wouldn't say he's a fly on the wall, but he built the walls. Uh, Eric Bischoff, mm -hmm. um, yeah. of course, grateful that came out. I believe was it two years ago, three years ago? Do I have that time frame right? Uh, about yeah, about two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Time is a flat circle. It's hard to, <laughs> to remember. <laughs> I don't remember when it's when. Um, he's obviously a, a prominent piece of uh, of the documentary, as, as you might expect. Um, mm -hmm. He is someone that has been maligned, someone that has been criticized heavily, uh, uh, credited by some. And obviously, he sits in a very different space now uh, in, in his uh, kind of what he's looking to do and, and so on. I think he's kind of seen as an enemy by, uh, I'd say, AEW fans for sure. And that's a mm. whole separate conversation. I can, um, it's interesting because I, I, I thought this for a while. I don't know why I was thinking about this last year. Um, I think it was, he was ranting against Tony Khan or something about that. And I, 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 I understand why he might be, uh, a little, uh, prickly and a little, um, defensive when it comes to, uh, his, his own kind of his, his accomplishments. Right. Cause I think it is so easy to see, all the things he said now and just to see them as kind of you know, a grifterish, I think is, is what people have said. And it sometimes it, it comes off like that, but this is someone that his legacy has been um, really tarnished in. And I can understand why he's a bit defensive about certain aspects of the WCW run. You know, uh, could there be a different, um, uh, a different um, accounting of him if maybe he had been a little bit more, maybe open about certain things about his mistakes and a little bit more contrite perhaps, but that doesn't seem to be his personality. Um, but it's, it's interesting because I'm watching him on the dock last night and there are certain aspects that make complete sense. And, and as he's talking about stuff, kind of like trying to go to um, the reason to bring the the show to universal studios or, or Disney, I'm trying to remember which, which it is because he was having to darken the arena because they weren't drawing fans when he was uh, when he was taking over kind of on the rise. And there's so many elements that made me think of uh, AEW right now because you know the darkened arenas and so on and and you know that subject can be talked to death. But I, I find him to be very very fascinating because I don't um, I understand why he I, I understand a lot of kind of why he may be upset and feel like he's not respected. A lot, and I think there might have been some sort of falling out with Tony Khan. This kind of, you know, uh, strewn things uh, a certain way that he's seen as not uh, valuable, uh, despite all this experience. But there's, there's definitely accomplishments that he had that I think get overlooked. That's a long way of kind of saying that. Just I, I think about him more often than than I should in terms of kind of where he's at and uh, his legacy and, and things like last night and, and think about the Nitro book and so on and so forth. Just kind of bring some of that back so sorry for that long winded i don't even know what i'm asking for a question but got your thoughts yeah. on working with eric bischoff and so on and so forth okay yeah i was kind of thinking to myself okay i'm waiting for the question <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but no i i get what you're saying um yeah. well yeah there's there's a chapter in the the nitro book uh which covers his exit from wcw where we kind of collate all of these different perspectives and opinions on eric and his time running the company and there are some people who are very complimentary there are other people who are the complete opposite and we try to give you an idea of of how everyone saw the job that he did and then let the reader make up their own mind um which is something that i try to do in in my work essentially uh i will say that in the book that I co-wrote with Eric his second book, Grateful. There's a section in there where he specifically addresses exactly what you were talking about. And as Eric tells it, it really came down to, you know, Tony Khan uh, making that particular comment about Ted Turner, which I think was mm, delivered yes. via so social media, if I remember correctly. And that, that really sort of set Eric off and rubbed him the wrong way. And that's uh, not not a surprise to me, given what I know about him in terms of his loyalty. Um, I, I think you know w whether you speak to people who are fans of Eric or not. If they know him, they they do know him to be an extremely loyal person, and so I can completely see how, from his vantage point, he would have taken that in a in a certain way. Uh, beyond that, you know everything else that you that you sort of address there. You know I can't necessarily speak to. I think that's something that he. Could probably address in terms of his feelings on you know his legacy or his his uh, reputation or what have you um but i do think that uh, again in the nitro book there's there's many many examples um which are 
cited by others and that's something that i want to point out because there's uh, to my knowledge there's no um <laughs> first person sentences or opinions given in the book it's uh, uh the the stories and the recollections of others and documentation that was uh, presented to me by other people um there's there's plenty of things which point to you know the great work that he did and there's obviously a lot of uh people who feel differently and then as i said it's i think up to the reader to kind of take away that what they will but in terms of the specific issue with aew um that's something that is addressed in the book and and again in terms of what eric has to say it was that specific comment which really set all of that in motion yeah so let's talk about sitting ringside our uh, main event mm -hmm. of the evening so to speak so this is uh this mm -hmm. came out uh just uh, about a month ago or so maybe two months ago give or take but again, yeah yeah yeah, so Sitting Ringside Volume 1, uh, Dave Penzer, again, as we mentioned, um, long time uh, WCW ring announcer, has seen a lot of stuff uh, in, in some of the things that we talked about earlier. And tell me, I guess, how this first, well, I was interested, of course, how this first came together, because obviously, I, I assume you talked to him uh, for the uh, for the Nitro book mm -hmm. uh, in some form or fashion, and then as part of the, I think it was 140 people or so of people that you, that you talked to. Uh, mm -hmm. How did this? How did this first come together? And then we can get in, get into kind of the uh, the machinations of how this specific structure of the book came together. Yeah, I appreciate that. So David and I first connected, I think, back in 2015, and I interviewed him for two or three hours for the Nitro book and had a really good experience. And that was the first time that we got in touch. And uh, we may have had a little bit of communication since then, but last year, the, the in the early part of last year, um, David actually tagged me on social media and was talking about the fact that he had come across um, in his sort of, uh, you know, personal archives or in his office or what have you, a bunch of um, format sheets and memos and documents from his time in WCW specifically and in other places, which I'm sure we'll get into as well, that he had kept on to for, for all of these years. And I think he was kind of looking to see what could be done with all of these materials. Um, you know, should I bring these to a convention with me? Should I try to sell them online? Like, what can I do with them? And I kind of find myself in a similar position because I had a bunch of stuff as well, which simply due to time and space constraints couldn't make their way into the Nitro book. And I had actually been going through a similar thought process in terms of what am I going to do with a bunch of this stuff. And so we got to talking initially about doing a scrapbook where we basically said, let's do a gigantic book where we're going to combine everything that we have. And it's going to be something that people can pick up and leaf through at their, at their leisure, essentially. Um, we're not necessarily going to be telling a story, but maybe we'll kind of mix in a couple of you know tales from the road or personal anecdotes that you want to share about particular people. And that's initially what we started doing. But to be completely honest, once I started interviewing David seriously for the book and listening to what he had to say, I realized there was, there was a much more interesting story here than that I think either of us probably first um, first conceptualized at the beginning, because David and and like almost everyone in the wrestling business, I would say, but David has had a, a very interesting life, and I found it very. Uh, I, I find the the idea of someone who was unapologetically just a huge wrestling fan mm. as a child, and and had you know made it clear to to everyone that this is what i want to do with my life i have to find a way into the wrestling business someone who has started from that starting point and actually made it happen and found themselves in the middle as we said earlier of this huge boom period and a fly on the wall for all sorts of important discussions with key people and obviously over time you know david's responsibilities evolved people know him ha as the ring announcer which of course he was but he was involved in talent relations he was even on the booking team at the end of wcw so just you know when i sat back and looked at it and i said wow we've got the chance to really investigate a lot of different areas here by virtue of the fact that he was associated with WCW for 10 years. And then if we can get into his backstory, I think that's going to be really inspirational for people. And then the added layer on top of all of that, which you may have picked up upon in reading the book is David is extremely open with a lot of the mental health struggles and challenges that he's had over the years. And I know that in the year 2024, that's not exactly a novel concept for someone to talk publicly about that. But in terms of how uh, how open David is about some of those struggles and specifically what was going on at the time and some of the things that he was experiencing and, and uh, 
the despair that he was um, encountering at times prior to his uh, involvement in the wrestling business and even during his involvement in the wrestling business. You know, I, I thought we, we can't just do a scrapbook and th throw in these things as, a, as an anecdote here or there. We really need to develop this into a full-blown autobiographical story. So essentially what we did to put a button on it is we ended up producing almost two books in one. So you have um, basically a traditional kind of autobiography from David's early upbringing all the way up until the end of WCW. And then we supplement that with, I think, about 200 or 220 pages of all of these bonus materials we alluded to earlier, the, the scripts, the notes, the documents, and so forth. We have things in there like the last Nitro format. We have the format that was put together on the the night that David Arquette was supposed to win the belt, <laughs> which is not what happened on screen. So you can look at that and go back and watch the the main event if I, i'm not sure why you you would uh, but if you wanted to <laughs> and you can kind of see the discrepancy there we even have the episode of nitro where vince russo you know quote unquote won the belt that's in there as well all kinds of interesting stuff to to look at and um you know because we had to tell all of that story and because there was so much bonus stuff to put in um you know we eventually said you know this is this is going to be volume one of two because we haven't even touched on TNA or the XWF or all of these other things that he's done with his life since then. And of course, he has all kinds of interesting documents that relates to those companies as well. So oh, um, that, that's that's what's going to be following later in the year is volume two. But hopefully that answers your question. I think I've gotten the habit here of uh, going off on a few <laughs> tangents. <laughs> it's good. It's good. So podcasts are all about. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention. So uh, it's about yeah 264 pages of, yeah like you point out, documentary. And then it's a you know a couple hundred pages of, uh, of documentation. So I mean, mm -hmm. God bless people that actually keep this stuff. I am one of those people. For my days, I have a bunch of uh, <laughs> a bunch of. I probably not as many people are interested in that as there in WCW stuff. But the but I, I think you know, in, in flipping through this as, as I'm going through it now, it really and I was mentioning this to you before was it for those that are really interested in, in how the sausage works, uh, how sausage mm -hmm. is made from a production standpoint and there are definitely production geeks out there there's no doubt about that i i'm one of them and, and like i'm like the storylines are fine all this stuff i just want to know kind of how this is you know all, just the real fascinating stuff it's all here and mm -hmm. stuff and it gives people an appreciation of how things are really timed down to the very second because when you work in sports uh especially there's the game itself you know i'm talking about you know traditional pro sports is game itself which you can't really control the time other than, you know, with commercial breaks and things like that and, and, and set TV timeouts. But when it comes to the in, in arena production and, and all this, there's everything has to be timed out because mm -hmm. you can't just say, Oh, we'll figure it out on the fly. Cause then it becomes a sloppy mess and, and, and people can you know figure out how that would turn out with this and you know, with wrestling. Um, it's very similar as you have, it's, it has to be more structured because you have an, a specific allocated TV time or a specific allocated pay-per-view time. And we've seen what's happened, of course, when uh, those go awry, as uh, what happened with that uh, classic um, you know, WCW pay-per-view. I'm blanking which one it was where they had to show the main event the following uh, the following day. Or, oh, um, the Halloween um, Havoc. Yes, Halloween yeah. Havoc. Yes, they had to show the main yeah. event, and people didn't get what they paid for. Um, you try to avoid disasters like that. So one of the things that's really cool about it is those documentation. It, it's not just uh, run sheets, but it's all, it's, run sheets are part of it, but it shows all these different things. So I think people that are willing to, um, you know, if they haven't checked that things out like that before, they can really kind of understand how this works. And maybe perhaps they look at this and they're like, the next time they're watching Raw or SmackDown or mm. Dynamite or, or or their wrestling show from their local indie, they get an appreciation of, oh, this stuff is timed out. Okay, this is how this, you know, I think those are cool things for people that really want to kind of do a 360 view on the on the world of TV production. Uh, they're going to get a lot out of this, uh, this documentation on the back. That's right. And it's interesting to see how things evolved or perhaps devolved, depending on your perspective over time with WCW, because if you look at those formats, you'll see that in the early years, there would be relatively sparse instructions accompanying these various segments. So for a particular match, for example, there may simply be a note, match begins and ends in this segment. And it would perhaps indicate who was going to go over, as they say in the wrestling business. But you go and look at a format for Nitro or Thunder in the year 2000, and you'll just see, you know, eight or 10 or 12 
detailed bullet points uh, to go with each match. You'll even see a lot of promos that are written out word for word. And of course, the performers had the had some freedom to modify that a little bit. But um, I'm fairly sure if you were to hold up one of those scripts and watch the actual show in front of you on Peacock or the network or or, or so so forth, um, you would see you know a lot of consistency there. So um, I think that's been fairly well established. You know, people know that uh, you know as time went on, the shows ended up becoming. Um, you know, more tightly scripted and the formats went from being perhaps half a dozen pages to in some cases, 25 to 30 pages. And, uh, you know, I think we can go back and look at the numbers and look at the record and question whether or not that was a good decision. I think that's, that's a sort of fairly obvious conclusion to draw out of that, but it's definitely interesting to see that up close and, and to see, you know, uh, what some of these legendary performers in the business were being given. I mean, I, there's, there's one, format in there where there's a it's probably a three or four hundred word promo you know typed out for rick flair you know mm -hmm. circa 2000 and you just think man you know i've never worked in this business never been in that environment but i i can't imagine you know uh handing that to someone like rick flair at, at that time with all of his experience in the business but that's the direction they went into and uh you know unfortunately i don't think things worked out too well yeah it, you brought a point up i didn't even think you could actually watch along with an episode and follow along with the actual production notes. I, I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. fast, it's so fascinating because it's uh, I, I think it, it gives better context when you hear people talk about current day wrestling in, in say, you know, Dave and Brian recap your show and they say, Oh, you know, mm -hmm. this, this segment went over and right. then you realize, or like when uh, the rock is part of this WrestleMania run, I think one of the, one of the long segments when like, 45 minutes or something it was something it just and it went completely over so mm -hmm. think about that you're in live production you have a certain amount of time and then you have to look at this and be like what are we cutting what are we changing on the fly mm -hmm. as you have you know 10 to 15 performers that are set to go on the rest of the show what are we doing here that's to get related to the production truck and there's all these like it's uh i, I think yeah i think books like this and especially you know documentation like that really helps uh can help illustrate for those willing to learn about it can really help illustrate how difficult this all can be with just one change it's a ripple effect um so that's good stuff there so yeah so uh, one thing as you mentioned earlier so some people may be thinking oh you know why why would uh why is a, a ring announcer need two volumes well when you talk about the documentation two is this very uh distinct uh career changes after wcw ended and then, mm -hmm. so you're talking about with uh, with TNA and, and XWF and, and other endeavors that there's more of the story to tell and more documentation too. That's right. And I'm especially excited about the stuff that David has on the XWF because he was integrally involved in that entire operation. That's actually, you know, David lives about 20 minutes from me here in Tampa. And that's the reason that he moved down here initially in 2001 was to work on that project. And he was kind of the point person for a lot of it and had his hands in in many aspects of the company, which obviously, you know, the entire endeavor didn't last very long. Um, but he has, for example, the original XWF business plan, which is this mm. very detailed document that, that lays out specifically, you know, here's what we need to do to be profitable. Here's what we're going to focus on. Uh, here's our strategy, essentially, as a company moving forward. He has all of that. He has the initial financials for the company. You know, again, as you said before, God bless him that he kept uh, hold of all of this stuff. So um, that's going to be, you know, we're in the process of doing that right now. And that's going to be, uh, you know, fun to, to finalize volume two because we don't have to rely on, you know, memories alone from 20 plus years ago, we can actually use these documents as a trigger to investigate some of these areas and, and back up what David is actually saying as well. So he has, like I said, just tons of stuff on the XWF. He has a lot of um, formats and even emails from his time in TNA. And then um, as you kind of alluded to there, you know, he's branched out and and gone into some other areas personally and professionally which i think people will be interested to to learn about and we'll kind of um you know sprinkle that into volume two as well even you know things like uh, for a while david was the tour manager for roddy piper's uh uh book tour back in i guess this would have been around 2002 or so 2002 yeah. 2003 so he spent 45 days on a bus with roddy piper right and so <laughs> Wow. When we when when he brought that up to me, he kind of 
I mean, David is 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 extremely good at being able to. Uh, he's very perceptive, and he's very very good at giving you when, when he describes what a person was actually like behind the scenes. You can see it. He's 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 very vivid in that in that way. But he almost mentioned kind of in passing. You know, we were talking about Piper, and he said, "Yeah, you know, I went on to." Uh, be his tour manager and spent 45 days on a bus with him and i was just like <laughs> what hold, hold on let's just stop right there that needs to be that that's a chapter right there in volume two because i'm sure if we uh, if, if we can provide the appropriate trigger as i mentioned to bring back some of those memories he's going to have a lot to to say about that so uh so yeah i think by the time people get to the end of volume two they'll see why we had to split it up and i would say two 500 page books are probably better than having having a uh thousand page book on your excuse me thousand page book on your desk so that's what's coming later in the year good stuff yeah looking forward to that um one thing mm -hmm. I, oh, I was going to ask you know as you're going through this documentation with them and i mentioned you do uh you, you know living so close doing a lot of them, i'm sure in person mm -hmm. were there were there moments where he's just kind of going through stuff and then he just like i almost think i'm in documentaries you see someone like review looking like old pictures all of a sudden and they just they have an emotional moment or they just um they kind of just like wow it elicits memories and then they just kind of go on for you know however long they do about a specific story mm -hmm. or things like that because some of these things you know uh, you know these uh, these documents are obviously you know decades old but the memories are still there i imagine there must have been some of those moments where you know it went in places where you or even he didn't expect you're absolutely right uh i can think of a very Good example to that end which is talking about the last nitro mm. and we sat down did that in person and just opened it up very general question okay let's talk about it what what do you remember and of course your mind is going to go to the places it usually does initially so as he started talking about it, it this was sort of what i'd heard before in other interviews that he'd done and, and so on and so forth but as we started talking more and more um i think further details really began to come back and you know david found himself saying a couple of times he's like wow i, I kind of forgot that you know I, I i remember now that's what i did when i heard the news i called you know i emailed tony shivani or i called craig leathers and we had this conversation and you know i remember this was exactly what everyone was talking about i remember talking to jeff jarrett you know that, that it's all coming back to me now and I think it just goes to show that even with the passage of time, a lot of times those kind of memories are still there. It just it just takes sometimes the the right environment or luck or timing or whatever to bring it out, and um, and that's just a really rewarding thing as a writer to know that we're going to be able to provide people with an additional layer of detail than they would have had had they listened to other interviews involving this person before. Um, you know, one aspect that we talked about earlier was this mental health piece, and quite late on. In the process of doing interviews we were talking about something and all of a sudden david had mentioned that there was like a six month period during his time in wcw where he could barely get himself on the plane to go to these shows and found himself like looking in the mirror prior to going out there to the audience asking himself how the hell am i going to do this again i you know I, I just can't be here right now um you know he's had a, a long history with anxiety and panic attacks and things like that dating back to college which we go into in the book um the reason i bring that up is to say that david i don't think until we started doing the book and talking about a lot of these things in detail i don't think he had actually remembered that mm. <laughs> and he kind of put it out of their mind as we all do with certain things right we, we, we put certain things in a box there's things you want to think about there's things you don't um regardless of you know the trajectory of your life i think everyone does that to some extent and he said man i can remember now and i said when when was this exactly he's like this is when we were rocking and rolling like this wasn't when the company was going down and everyone was you know burned out and depressed being on the road he said this is when we were kind of on fire and he was like you know i was on the phone every night with my dad who was a psychologist incidentally and you know he was encouraging me to to hang in there and it was really really tough for me to go to work and you know as a viewer you're not thinking about those kind of things right when you see the the ring announcer come out there or whoever you're not thinking about their sort of life behind the curtain to that extent but i just Again, I thought it was it, that's just a really rewarding part of the process to be able to bring about, even though it may be a painful memory, to bring about something like that that someone else may read and say, wow, you know, if this guy was going through these problems and was able to overcome it and still live his dream, then maybe I can do that in my life as well. Mm. So very, very appreciative of David to be, you know, that revealing. He was completely an open book, I will say that.
Yes. Good pun. I like that. An open book. I like it. Oh, there we go. Didn't even realize. (laughs) (laughs) And you at home should open up this book. It is again called Sitting Ringside, Volume 1. Uh, Dave Penzer and Guy Evans. You can buy it on uh, on Amazon, of course. And, and is that the preferred method to uh, to buy this, or do you have a, a website for it, or what's the deal there? Well, I would uh, thank you, Josh. I would uh, encourage people, yes, Amazon, but also if you go to davidpenzerbook.com, uh, which should be easy to remember, davidpenzerbook.com, what you'll see is we actually have a bunch of bundle options that come along with your purchase of the book. So if you wanted even more of these rare formats, you know that would be the place to go. If you're interested in having David sign the last Nitro format for you and sign the book and, and sign some other things, and I think we even have an option on there where you can do a Zoom call uh, with David and I after purchasing one of the bundles. All of those options are there, davidpenzerbook.com, or as Josh just said, you can go to Amazon. And uh, I guess if we're wrapping up, I just want to say I really appreciate the time, Josh, and look forward to hopefully doing this again. Oh, well, well, not wrapping up just yet. I have one other question for you. Are oh, you um, even better? <laughs> yes, on a on a on a, a on a book nerd front, are you are you self publishing all these? Yes, I am. Correct. Wow, look at you. So that was because uh, these book. You, sometimes you see some self published books, and you're like, you can tell they are. But these, uh, right. I mean, it, Nitro and everything. Everything is uh, that's quite an endeavor. So I, I uh, mm. that that's almost like a whole separate podcast of. <laughs> about that whole process that's uh that's pretty impressive well thank you i mean if, if you ever wanted to do kind of a business discussion we should get into that but uh i am entrepreneurial by nature so i wouldn't have it any other way but i appreciate those those kind words thank you good stuff we'll be looking forward to volume two coming out and i would say yeah if you're if you're a fan of wcw and uh and and inside the inside track, so to speak, uh, and very inside again with some of the documentation I was mentioning before. I think, uh, especially this is a perfect pairing with um, who killed WCW. David Penzer did not kill WCW. I'll, I'll reveal that now. But I think if you're kind of getting in the nostalgia feel, and uh, maybe if you haven't read Nitro, maybe pick that book up as well. I mean, hey, why not? And uh, sitting ringside, volume one. Yeah, I think it's a for those WCW nostalgists. I think this is a, a good, perfect uh, double uh, double play companion. Of course, the trip of play coming uh, later on this year with Volume Two. We hope, and uh, we'll talk to hopefully talk to David at that time. And I have a lot of questions for him as a former uh, ring announcer myself. Uh, not to his mm-hmm. level of fame by any means, but I love to talk about him and uh, and kind of the lineage with guys like I was talking before, like Gary Michael Capetta, and and uh, he wrote a book called Body Slams. We were talking about before off air, uh, Howard Finkel, of course, and and uh, you know obviously ring announcers and other sports as well, and. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, sure he's got a lot of stories there. So looking forward to talking with him. Uh, so, Guy, we got all the plugs. Any any other plugs uh, to get out, social media-wise or anything like that? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, Guy Evans Books is the place to go, guyevansbooks.com. As Josh said, if you want to check out whether it's the Nitro book or the new book with David Penzer or the Eric Bischoff book, yes. uh, you know, that's, that's the best place to go. And uh, hopefully we get a chance to do this again, like I said. So, um, again, really appreciate it, Josh. Looking forward to a perfect summer reading as uh, as we enter the summer season. So, Guy Evans, thanks so much. Thank you.